Here's a cheer, a sports cheer you can use. I'm giving this to you. But here's a little cheer. A lot of people like it. It goes like this. Rat shit, bat shit, uh, dirty old twat. 69 assholes tied in a knot. Hooray! Blizzard shit. Five! The tiny man who's knows, who knows more Thomas the Tank Engine stories than anyone else. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm National Press Club welcome for Mr. George Carlin. And just to relieve you of any outstanding anxieties, I can assure you that I'm not here to advance any political, social, or environmental cause. I am, in fact, blessedly agenda-free. I don't want to save the river, I don't want to save the bay, I don't want to save the canyon, the whale, the wetlands, the rainforest, or the flying spotted dwarf, something or other. I don't want to save the children above all, frankly. <laughs> Frankly, I don't care about many of those things, and be between you and me, those battles were lost a long time ago. I'm not interested in freeing someone, boycotting something, or preventing anything. I am interested in keeping my lunch inside my mouth if I can. <laughs> and I don't want to make something optional. I refuse to wear ribbons of any color. You might say I'm just here to help define deviancy down. To be honest, there aren't many things I do believe in, but high among them would be friendship, family ties, and romantic love. I think those things can take you a long way. For the record, the only worthy cause I have devoted time to is a little-known place that does wonderful work, St. Anthony's Home for the Visually Unpleasant. <laughs> it's, it's run by the Little Sisters of the Heinous, and in fact, they operate a number of facilities. The Rochester Home for the Permanently Disheveled, the New England Haven for the Occasionally Coherent, and the Catholic Shelter for those who up until a year ago seemed to be doing just fine. And because you and I have at least one thing in common, which is that all of us deal with language all the time, I thought it might be nice today for me to come to you with some of my language complaints. Certainly not to blame them on you, although, of course, you are implicated. <laughs> and not that you can help it. I mean, the problem is really with the people you cover. The politicians, the celebrities, and the lawyers. And although their level of insincerity is astonishing, it's still kind of fun to hear them talk. In particular, it's fun to listen to Washington talk. Whenever the issue of term limits comes up, I always tell people the only term limits I'm interested in would be to limit some of the terms used by politicians. They speak, of course, with great caution because they must take care not to actually say anything. Proof of this, according to their own words, is that they don't actually say things, they indicate them. As I indicated yesterday, and as the president indicated to me, but sometimes they don't indicate, they suggest. Let me suggest that, as I indicated yesterday, <laughs> I haven't determined that yet. See, they don't decide, they determine. If it's a really serious matter, they make a judgment. I haven't made a judgment on that yet. When the hearings are concluded, I will make a judgment, or I might make an assessment. I'm not sure. I haven't determined that yet. But when I do, I will advise you. They don't tell, they advise. I advised him that I had made a judgment. Thus far, he hasn't responded. They don't answer, they respond. He hasn't responded to my initiative. An initiative is an idea that isn't going anywhere. <laughs> when he responds to my initiative, I will review his response, take a position, and make a recommendation. See, they don't read, they review, they don't have opinions, they take positions, and they don't give advice, they make recommendations. And so, at long last, after each has responded to the other's initiatives, and each has reviewed the other's responses, and everyone has taken a position, made a judgment, and offered a recommendation, now they have to do something. But that would be much too direct. So instead, they address the problem. We're addressing the problem, and we'll soon be proceeding. That's a big activity here in Washington. Proceeding. They're always proceeding or moving forward. A lot of that goes on. Senator, have you solved that problem? Well, we're moving forward on that. And when they're not moving forward, they're moving something else forward, such as the process. We have to move the process forward so we can implement the provisions of the initiative 
in order to meet these challenges. No one has problems anymore. Challenges. That's why we need people who can make the tough decisions. Tough decisions like how much soft money can I expect to collect in exchange for my core values? <laughs> so that... so that I can continue my work in government. Of course, no politician would admit to such a lowly station as working in government, serving the nation. I'm serving the nation. Another favorite distortion is public service. I'm in public service. I like America, don't you? The food is great, but the public service is terrible. Now, folks, a question for you. Do you think it's possible that one of these politicians, whose judgment is so poor that he honestly thinks of himself as serving the nation, might occasionally be expected to indulge in a little patriotism? Huh? What do you think? Well, of course, not only is it possible, it's inevitable, and that's when he's at his very best. That's when he trots out the really good stuff all across this great land of ours, the greatest nation on earth, the greatest nation in the history of the world. And in times of military crisis, you can be sure that someone in a suit in this town will eventually plant himself in front of a camera and carry on a great deal about the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Now, normally during peacetime, the politicians will refer to people in the military as our young men and women stationed around the world. But in wartime, they quickly become our brave young fighting men and women stationed halfway around the world in places whose names they can't pronounce, wondering if they'll ever see their loved ones again. For added emotional impact, sons and daughters can always be substituted for men and women. And so I think we can sum this up by saying that where the military is concerned, the extent of a politician's insincerity can be measured by how far around the world our, station, our soldiers are stationed and whether or not any of them can pronounce it. Incidentally, another way of expressing this sentiment is to say we're sending our young men and women to places the average American can't find on a map. I've always thought it was kind of funny and somewhat out of character for a politician to go out of his way to point out the low level of American intelligence when indeed his very job depends upon it. It would seem to fly in the face of that other rhetorical standby of theirs. The American people are a lot smarter than they're given credit for. This is said with a straight face, although it is obvious, of course, that the proposition is being stated precisely backwards. But, but the politicians, God bless them, or something like that, they're at their most entertaining when they're in trouble. When they're in trouble, their explanations usually begin simply with words like miscommunication. What did you do wrong, Senator? Well, it was a miscommunication. Or I was quoted out of context. Better yet, and more ironic, they twisted my words. Such a nice touch. A person who routinely spends his days torturing the language complains, they twisted my words. <laughs> then, as the controversy continues to heat up, he moves to his next level of complaint. The whole thing has been blown out of proportion. The whole, it's always the whole thing. Apparently, no one has ever claimed that only a small portion of something was blown out of proportion. Has to be the whole thing. That's because now he's feeling the heat. And so, as time passes and more evidence comes in, he suddenly changes directions and tells us, we're trying to get to the bottom of this. Now he's on the side of law and order. Jiu-jitsu, really. We're, we're trying to get to the bottom of this so we can get the facts out to the American people. That's always a nice touch, American people. In fact, at this point, he might even say, I'm willing to trust in the fairness of the American people. Clearly, he's preparing us for something. <laughs> and so, when finally all the facts come out and our subject seems quite guilty, he employs that sublime use of the passive voice, mistakes were made. <laughs> mistakes were made, don't look at me. Probably someone in my office. <laughs> Things are moving faster now. Mistakes were made is rapidly overtaken by there is no evidence. No one has proven anything. Eventually I will be exonerated. I have faith in the American judicial system. And that certain sign that things are closing in, whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? <laughs> whatever happened? Well, nah, yeah. Well, he's about to find out. <laughs> now, we know this must be true because the next thing we hear from him is, I 
just want to put this thing behind me and get on with my life. I just want to put this behind me. That's an expression we hear a lot these days in all walks of life. From people in all walks of life, usually the person in question has committed some unspeakable act. Yes, it's true, I strangled my wife, shot the triplets, set fire to the house, and sold my young son to an old man on the train. But now, I just want to put this thing behind me. Get on with it. Personally, what I want to do is to put this, I want to put this thing behind me and get on with my life, thing behind me and get on with my life. And just to round out this section, let's hope there's a special place in hell reserved for those who have recently decided to take responsibility for their actions. That's the big thing now, taking responsibility for your actions, like it's a recent discovery, you know. He's taking responsibility for his actions. Well, isn't that wonderful? Ask him if he's willing to take responsibility for my actions, along with my alimony, my car payments, and my gambling debts. I'd like to mention America's love affair with euphemisms and euphemistic language. I think Americans have some difficulty dealing with reality and have invented a kind of soft language to protect themselves. And this tendency to euphemize, if that's a, a verb, uh, increases, it, it seems, with every generation. Here's an example. There's a well-known condition in combat when a fighting man's nervous system has been stressed to the breaking point and he's either snapped or is ready to snap. In the First World War, that condition was known as shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language. Two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was over 80 years ago. Then an entire generation passed, and in the Second World War, the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. <laughs> then we had Korea, 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high, and the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. We're up to eight syllables now, and the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's absolutely sterile, operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. <laughs> Finally, of course, there was Vietnam, and given the lies surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen, and, and the pain is now completely buried under jargon, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd be willing to bet that if we'd still been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have gotten the attention they needed at the time they needed it. Well, sometime during my life, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. I, I, I was not consulted on this. It, it just happened. Sneakers became running shoes. Loafers became slip-ons. Motels became motor lodges. Trailers became mobile homes. Travel, pl travel plazas, I'm sorry, truck stops became travel plazas. And used cars became previously owned transportation. Manicurists evolved into nail technicians. At about the same time, store clerks became product specialists and sales associates. Employees became staff. Uniforms became career apparel. Maids became room attendants, and room service became guest room dining. Information turned into directory assistance. Medicine turned into medication. The dump turned into the landfill. Gambling joints turned into gaming resort. Wife beating became intermittent explosive disorder. And constipation became occasional irregularity. Rain forests and wetlands came into existence because the environmentalists discovered people were not willing to give money to save jungles and swamps. If someone got sick, they went to the hospital or they went to the doctor. Now, the health maintenance organization sends them to a wellness center where they consult a health care delivery professional. Poor people used to live in slums. Now, the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. Some of this language can make you want to throw up. Well, perhaps engage in an involuntary protein spill. Now. Yeah. Now, if all of this begins to put you in mind of so-called politically correct language, or politically correct speech, excuse me, uh, then you and I are on the same track. So let's visit that playground of guilty white liberals, the land of the politically correct. In recent years, the PC folks have found some new ways of shading the truth in order to make people feel better, especially minorities. One of the newer phrases making the rounds is happens to be. 
he happens to be black. I have a friend who happens to be black. Oh, I see, yes, yes. <laughs> like it's an accident, you know. Happens to be black. Yes, he happens to be black. I see, I see, I see. He had two black parents? Yes, that's right, two black parents. Yes. <laughs> I see. And they had sex? Oh, indeed they did. I see. So where does the surprise part come in? I should think it would be more unusual if he just happened to be Scandinavian. And, and while we're at it, when did the word urban become synonymous with the word black? Did I sleep through this, perhaps? Urban styles, urban trends, urban music. I was not consulted on this at all again. Didn't get an email, didn't get a fax, didn't get a postcard. That's fine. Let them go. So, I would like to tell you how I handle some of these speech issues concerning minorities. First of all, I say black. I say black because most black people prefer black. I don't say people of color because it's dishonest. It means precisely the same thing as colored people, which is an insult. So if you're not willing to say colored people, you shouldn't be willing to say people of color. And besides, to me, the whole idea of color seems a bit specious, really. I mean, what should we call white people? People of no color? Isn't, isn't pink a color? And in fact, white people are not really white at all. They're different shades of pink and olive and beige. In other words, they're colored. And, and black people are rarely black. I see mostly various shades of brown and tan, and in fact, some light-skinned uh, black people are darker than the darkest white people. I'm sorry, lighter than the darkest white people. Look how dark the people in India are. They're dark brown, but they're considered white. May I see the color chart, please? <laughs> People of color is an awkward phrase that obscures meaning rather than enhancing it. What shall we call fat people? People of size? <laughs> I also don't say African Americans. I find it cumbersome and confusing. Which part of Africa are we talking about? Egypt? Egypt is in Africa, but Egyptians aren't black. They're like the people in India. They're dark brown white people, but they're Africans. So why wouldn't an Egyptian citizen who becomes a, uh, I'm sorry, an Egyptian who becomes a U.S. citizen be called an African American? The same would apply to South Africa. Suppose a white racist from South Africa becomes an American citizen. Couldn't he call himself an African American? <laughs> if for no other reason than just to bother black people. And, and what about a black person born in South Africa who becomes an American citizen? Is he an African-American or is he a South African-American? Or is he simply a South African-American, African-American? <laughs> you know, it's just so much more tedious liberal labeling. Liberals should be taught that labels divide people, and I think we could probably do with fewer labels, not more. And I simply can't justify this awkward phrase, Native Americans. So everyone is just visiting. So much for native. As far as calling them Americans is concerned, well, how can I say this? We steal their hemisphere, destroy 500 cultures, kill 20 million, stick the rest of them on the worst land we can find, and then as a special bonus, we name them after ourselves. It's, it's embarrassing. It's, it's just embarrassing. The truth is, most Indians are insulted by the term Native American. The American Indian movement will tell you that. If you wish to please Indians, try calling them by their traditional names, Pawnee, Mohawk, Navajo, Seminole, and so on. Each of us can do things the other can't, differently abled. The word crippled is not a dishonorable word. There's no shame in it. Jesus healed the cripples. He didn't engage in rehabilitative strategies for the physically disadvantaged. <laughs> And we have then this continuing problem with the word fat. I use that term because that's what fat people are. They're fat. That's why we call them fat people. They're not large, they're not stout, they're not chunky, hefty, or plump, and they're not big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. And they're not necessarily obese. Obese is a medical term. And they're not overweight. Overweight implies there is some correct weight. There is no correct weight. Heavy is also a misleading term. An aircraft carrier is heavy. It's not fat. Only, only people are fat, and that's what fat people are. They're fat. They're not exempt. Uh, for, they're not, for example, gravitationally disadvantaged. I offer no apology for this, by the way. It's not intended as criticism or insult. It's simply descriptive language. I'm not comfortable with euphemisms. I prefer seeing things the way they are, not the way some people wish they were. Bing me. <laughs> you can edit this. I'm a man for the millennium, digital and smoke-free. I've been inputted, outsourced, uplinked, and downloaded. I have software on my hard drive, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. I'm factory authorized, returnable, fully equipped, built to last, and I'm definitely biodegradable. My output is down, but my income is up. I'm tanned, rested, and market-tested, user-friendly, and lactose intolerant. 
A diversified, multicultural, postmodern deconstructionist. I'm a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, high-concept rageaholic, and I have a love child who sends me hate mail. I'm an alpha male on beta blockers, a bottom feeder and a top gun, a Bigfoot rainmaker. I give soft money with hard cash and my revenue stream has a cash flow of its own. I'm ahead of the curve, riding the wave and pushing the envelope. I'm on board, on point, on message, but off drugs. I take power naps, I take victory laps. I've got a personal trainer, a personal shopper and a personal agenda. I'm a totally ongoing slam dunk no-brainer with an outreach that's proactive. I eat junk food, I get junk mail, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash sports. I've been dumbed down with smart bombs. I'm in denial, I'm in recovery, but I'm out of the loop. I'm also on the bubble. A high-tech lowlife, anatomically, ecologically, and politically incorrect. An entry-level man with no exit strategy. Low rent, but high maintenance. Upscale, but down home. I got a minivan with a microwave from a mega store in the mini mall. I've been to outer space. I've been to outer space on the internet. I'm a non-believer and an overachiever. Emotionally deprived and market-oriented. I have hardcore software because I use the F word in my email. I'm new wave from the old school, and if I'm not at ground zero, you can reach me at square one. I'm gender-specific, voice-activated, capital-intensive, heat-seeking, faith-based, and work-related, but I'm definitely not group-oriented. I'm online, I'm in line, but most of the time I'm out of line. I'm cock block, I'm ready to rock, rough, tough, and hard to bluff. I put the pedal to the metal, party hardy, and to me, lunchtime is crunch time. Thank you. Stupid, trivial shit you don't care anything about. Things you're not even remotely interested in.